Next is Commissioner Grisham, and this is fiscal updates. And Matt, you will have to excuse me. I have new glasses, and I cannot read. I'm going back to my Thursday eye. Our chair can't read. If I sit and hold them against my eyes, I can see. No, it's the one thing. I, I'm not sure what the problem is, but. Madam Chair, next time I will use large type. This is large type. It's going to be 14 font. Okay. So, um, anyway, good morning. I have a feeling in the air that the legislative session is fast approaching. It is. The familiar cycle is. <laughs> and here's where we're going to be. So, um, you have asked us to address a couple of things, the budget adjustment pressures, um, if it's okay with the chair, we can start with those. So, um, I think in many ways, the, those of you who sat through last year's budget adjustment will see some familiarity in this year's. Uh, we have some of the same pressures. Um, the committee will recall that uh, at the e-board meeting in July, there was a, um, I think it netted out to about an 18 and a half, 19 million dollar uh, revenue upgrade. And add to that uh, a couple of uh, increases in direct applications and uh, a little bit of revenue here and there. And we're, we have a little over 20 million dollars. I suspect that will be um, there will be funding requests that are broadly in line with that. Um, for example, we uh, anticipate asking the, uh, the legislature to use some of that money to pre-fund some of our obligations that we know are coming up in fiscal 21, notably uh, the 27th pay period um, and a couple of payments we need for uh, EROF, the emergency relief fund that we have. Um, we also anticipate um, a little under a million dollars from the uh, request for the judiciary. I'm sorry. Can you the, there's a weird noise. Like yeah, that. and How it's in my area. Right? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. A little under a million dollars, I think they've, they've uh, pointed out to us. Um, there's some requests from public safety for um, overtime, which um, you'll remember from before. Um, we also have the Secretary of State's request for, during an election year, for funding. They usually get um, a one-time request for, uh, I think it was $400,000, $450,000 uh, to run the election. Um, and then within Human Services, um, I think some of these um, uh, requests will be familiar. The Brattleboro Retreat, we've been in dialogue with them. Um, I think the folks in Human Services can give you more details on that, but we uh, anticipate a request for the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, within corrections, there was an uh, unanticipated increase in out-of-state beds. Um, I think our view, um, which you may hear later on, is we're somewhere at the point where we're, we've topped out in that, but um, the out-of-state bed request has gone up. Um, there's also some additional requests within general assistance. Um, and the like. So, um, in total, um, I think we'll be in and around what we have available. Uh, we're still dialing in um, various details and the like, uh, which we will you know, let you know when we have a final number. That's a question. I, I, I couldn't hear the beginning. You, said, you think it's about 11 million? No, we think it'll be about roughly equal to the available funds, which is in and around. Oh, okay. Um, again, Did you we're, say something about 11, or I'm just making that up? No. Okay. Um, I think I said. It's just possible to hear back here. Yeah. <laughs> there is something. I'll make it. Maybe I should sit behind you so I can. <laughs> I wonder how they conduct board meetings. Well, they probably didn't have somebody drilling. I think, I think it's a leaf blower. Oh, that might be out there. Yeah, they're cleaning up oh, yeah. the streets. 
So, but we think, I mean, my general point was we think the available funds and the available requests will be in and around the same. And we're still working on details of that, um, obviously, but we, we um, wanted to leave the committee with the impression that we're, you know, the availability will match the demand in and around, we believe. Um, with the uh, budget development process, we, um, you know, there again, I think there'll be some familiarity uh, with the prior year. Uh, we have similar pressures. Um, we've got um, some, you know, pressures in uh, human services and caseloads, and you know, we got the usual pay act. Um, we've got some uh, maintenance requests and the like. We're actively working on the budget. We are, as we speak, our uh, you know, during the two weeks prior and over the next uh, two weeks, we'll be meeting with departments who are actively going through our budget uh, requests and, and trying to uh, figure out what we need to do and what we can do. Um, but I, I think the budget will be a similar um, story as we had in prior years. Uh, we've had a good amount of uh, uh, additional revenue. We have a comparable, in fact, a, a larger amount of additional expenditures and we're trying to make choices that will make those two equal each other. Um, Questions? So. Okay. Caseload reserve, is that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Matt Ribbon, uh, Deputy Finance Commissioner. Uh, I guess I would say that the, the state of, uh, of Vermont's reserves is strong. Uh, the human services case of reserve in particular is a little bit under a hundred million dollars. Uh, when you combine that with our other general fund reserves, uh, we are at uh, approximately two hundred and twenty six million dollars uh, of general fund reserves, uh, which uh, is is as high or higher than it's probably than it's ever been. Uh, it's, it equates, the, the, com the combination of the four reserves equates to a little under 14% of the general fund appropriations. Uh, and I think that some of the uh, recent national stress testing that's talked about uh, the impact of a potential economic downturn or, or substantial reduction in federal funds uh, had, had us in sort of that sort of range in terms of uh, the impact on Vermont, so um, so that's good news, and uh, we we will certainly be thinking about uh, the the ways that our reserves should be structured in a way that, that present themselves in the best foot forward with the rating agencies uh, to demonstrate the fact that 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 they um, are substantially higher than they've been in the past. Uh, yeah, um, we actually did some uh, structural changes last year. Are you? Are uh, we to infer from your comment that you're going to be proposing some other um, structural changes to reserves? Um, that would, that's no, I'm not saying that that would be that would be above my pay grade, but I would say that we certainly want to, at a minimum, make sure that the rating agencies understand the reserves that we do have, and that um, we we have, for instance, we have some concerns that maybe with the 2753 reserve that, that um, they may or may not be counting that. Okay. So we want to make sure that, that they understand the reserves that we do have. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? So the, uh, the 226 million general fund reserve, are you including uh, the 27 payroll? Yes. Okay, yeah. that includes it? Yes. And how much is, I'm sorry, how much is that? Uh, that is uh, about um, 16 million. Um, and the budget stabilization reserve, which is the primary reserve, is at 80 million, and our rainy day fund or balance reserve is at 32 million. Okay. Tax computer system modernization. So uh, that is a mouthful. It's known within our shop as CMF. Um, and the committee will remember this was. Uh, Created actually uh, over a decade ago, I believe, um, and um, there was a fund set up that was to pay for the new VTAC system, 
uh, among other things, and also to allow it to be upgraded and um, new modules purchased as necessary. Uh, the committee will recall that uh, going into last year, 80% of the additional revenues that were taken in uh, due to the new VTAC system were directed towards uh, the Department of Taxes to pay for the system, uh, which is now paid for, um, and also to maintain it. Um, the governor had recommended uh, reducing that because the system was paid for uh, from 80% um, of additional funds going to tax to 40%. The legislature saw, saw our 40% and raised us to 30%, or I, I forget the, the terminology, but anyway, the 40% went to 30% where it now uh, sits. Um, and uh, we may have other um, requests of the legislature coming into this session um, on what to do with that. But um, you have a uh, uh, a memo, I think, in as part of your packet that uh, describes in much uh, larger detail uh, what that money amounts to and the use of the money. And uh, I would welcome a, a few questions. And I, I thought that our tax commissioner, actually, our interim commissioner, was going to be here. He may have been thrown off by the earlier time, but he is available if the committee would like. Okay. Questions? Well, can you give us a hint of what's likely to come? Um, we may look at the percentage that it is at now, 30%, and um, look at further changing that. Further um, reduction. That would be the most likely. Oh, I, don't I, mean, wanna, the, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I think they've been talking about yeah. that. The, I just want to be sure. That, I mean, I think we were pretty confident that the 30 was a good number, um, and you're not saying it was too, too low. Okay, uh, I am not saying step. that. You're not saying that tax didn't get enough. No. I think the direction would likely be lower, but uh, you know, uh, I don't want to get ahead of tax, and they, they have, That's fine. they've thought about That's that. That's fine. So, Qu question came up earlier. Who is our tax commissioner at the moment? Well, we, have uh, we have interim uh, tax okay. commissioner Craig Bolio, and we are Bolio, B-O-L-I-O. Bolio. 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 I got that first name. Is, Thank you. Is he here? Um, I don't believe, but. He was gonna yeah, that's what the number of days I think the earlier time, I'm probably at fault for that. Um, this was originally. We are easy to find. <laughs> As you know, Madam Former Commissioner. Which may be why Yeah. Thanks. Um, would the committee like to hear from him? I'm happy to find him. I, I don't. Does the committee want to hear? No. Okay. Okay. It was just a question that had come up in the people in the room earlier. Some all the room again. That was the tax commission. Yeah. yeah. And that's a further reduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, there it is. It's a strong package. So that is it. Any other questions for Commissioner Gresham? All right. Thank, Thank you. Madam Chair. Okay, we are on to environmental contingency bond expenditures for Elmwood Avenue and Patricia Coppolino. No? We're running early. We're, early. Yeah. We're too efficient. Well, we could do the right. Which? Um, yeah, when I, I see plans during fiscal B. There was a request, uh, I think, uh, Senator uh, Fiscal made that maybe one of the grants that was submitted to us would be taken up by the committee. And I, I, don't, I don't think we let anybody from the grant, but it maybe we could have a. Uh, in particular, if you want to just explain what your thinking is. Of it. Me? Yeah. Um, well, I thought in light of the fact that we actually were meeting that we could take official action on the grant request. Um, oftentimes, uh, the meeting and the need to make a decision don't coincide. So I thought that um, the grant to um, the Department of Health uh, was one that we could vote on and just get, um, get it acted on officially today okay. um, since we're meeting. 
So uh, I'm willing to move approval of grant. It's on the 11:55 um, time for the agenda. Okay. That we accept that grant of uh, $440,955 to do this analysis. Second. Okay. Is there further discussion? I thought I saw some concerns floating around. I no, I okay. Representative yeah. Fagan said he wasn't going to be here, but he was <coughs> fine with the grant. Um, oh no, no. Yeah. Um, Senator um, Ash. Senator Ash has well. conversation and got clarification in okay. terms of what the work would be. That was uh, the one the, I saw. We were concerned about the suicide prevention aspects of it, and whether it would suggest we should wait for three years before we do anything. But so. his, his conversation had to do with um, consistency and accuracy of coding and uh, was much more technical and, and okay. in, um, in its focus. So that uh, question or concern got addressed and um, it's uh, indicated that he was following up acceptance. Okay. He's not here, so. No, he's in New York. Could be quiet. All right, so it's been moved and seconded that we approve the grant number 2979 $440,955. From the U.S. Center of Disease Control to the Department of Health. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Okay, that carries. And we're back. And this is I am our expenditure for Elmwood Avenue. You okay. Patricia Copley. Yes. Okay. Well. So we're looking to um, have a permission to expend over the $100,000 cap in two categories in the Environmental Contingency Fund. Um, there are two things that we're working on related to release of chlorinated solvents on Elmwood Ave in Burlington, Vermont. Um, they're specific to assessment um, of the a release of chlorinated solvents to the sewer line that's in Elmwood Ave and it's causing impacts to indoor air and homes where um, work needs to be done to take care of those indoor air impacts. And then there's um, a portion of the expenses that we're looking for related to assessing the degree and extent of that chlorinated solvent release from the sewer line. And the second piece is related to, the second request <coughs> for expenditures is related to actually taking care of that release, so the cleanup portion of it. Um, the way the ECF is set up, there's different categories that you can spend up to $100,000. And in each category, we're looking to bump up against those limits pretty soon. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Are, are you intending to go after the city of Burlington? No. And, uh, no? Why not? <laughs> um, the gadgets. gadgets, dry cleaning. Um, it's the responsible party. Well, maybe we should go after Gadget Drug We are. They're yeah. currently not. But it says here that, they, uh, that the city of Burlington discharged waste water sewer line. Industrial discharge is released, released from the city of Burlington waste sewer line. Water sewer line. So their wastewater sewer line um, is cracked in several locations that are down gradient from where releases from the dry cleaning facility discharge chlorinated solvents. So what we find the town of Bennington for putting a salt shed in a wetlands. Um, I don't know why we can't go after the city of Burlington. Why are they different from the town of Bennington? So the direction from the attorneys within a both the ANR General Council and DEC General Council have stated that going after a municipality for a failure with their um, infrastructure, wastewater line, is not something that the agency is proposing to do. Instead, I believe we find the town of Bennington on its wastewater system recently. Well, I think there may be differences between 
and then the, and the waste so there's the system the facility exactly. and then there's all the old water and sewer pipes yeah, that doesn't mean that the same <laughs> I mean, what's good for one is good for another, isn't it? The state is actually working with GADUs to try to get them to do the work in their insurance companies and the dry cleaner before GADUs. There's okay. been a dry cleaner at this facility since the 1940s. So you're going to see cost recovery. You're doing the work, but at the same time, you're working with the insurance company for the cleaner that actually produced and released the solvent. Once it got into the city's pipes, there were cracks oh. and the solvent got in to the ground. Correct. All right, so now we've got to clean that up. City of Burlington going to play any role in cleaning that up, like digging it up, supplying the equipment, personnel? We haven't gotten that far into that process yet. So we're in the process of um, identifying that there are eight plus homes that have impacted indoor air right now. We've directed GADUs and their insurance company to address those impacts and they've declined. So that's the first priority is to make sure that the people living in these homes have clean air to breathe. Okay. That's one of our requests so that we can install these systems. The second issue is that there is a release from the sewer line um, and a release underneath Gadget's dry cleaning building that needs to be addressed. The state is actively trying to, to determine the degree and extent from the sewer line and directing Gadget's to do both of those things. Gadget's has declined to do anything related to the sewer line. They're slowly moving forward with addressing the impacts underneath their dry cleaner. Okay, so this, this isn't a new solvent that they are not supposed to put into the sewer line but did, which is one thing. They're doing something that is presently illegal. Or is there a residue somewhere under their building that, what happened or do we know? So there's a dry cleaner there that operated from at least the 1940s Gadus um, purchased that dry cleaner and then they subsequently stopped dry cleaning in the facility around 1993 or 1994. During that time frame that dry cleaning was operating, they were discharging waste through their, their wastewater line into the city of Burlington's um, sewer. They, Gadus owns the building right now. They're not dry cleaning in there. They're doing some sort of furniture recovery process for property that was damaged during fire. So they own a property that has a, current, a release under it, under it, and they are liable for that release. Um, we've also determined that they are responsible for the release and the impact related to the, um, where the cracks are in the sewer line. So this Agency of Natural Resources has directed GADUs to address <coughs> all of that. The release under the dry cleaner, the release related to the <coughs> impacts from where the sewer line is, and the release to all of the indoor air impacts in the homes that are there. GADUs has declined to do anything related to the sewer line or the impacts, impacted indoor air, the residents. So it's going to court? Yes. Right. Other questions? I, I just find that I'm, I'm troubled. I don't want the residents of Elmwood Avenue to suffer with air that they can't or shouldn't be in. At the same time, I feel like I'm hearing, I hear from so many constituents about fines that are levied by the agency, and then they hear that we're not even going after the city of Burlington for their responsibility for their own sewer line, when I have to explain to my town manager why they have to pay fines for various things that go wrong in their systems. So it, it seems, I'd like some kind of report, whether from the Attorney General or from the agency, about why we're not going after the city of Burlington. Before I, you know, you know, again, I'll, I'll support raising the cap only because I don't want to see the residents impacted, but I feel like we have a different standard when it comes to some places, mainly Burlington. 
I'm wondering if you have any insight into the extent or the possible extent of the contamination. I hear you saying that's part of what this, these additional funds will help you understand, but what are the concerns? How broad of a sweep is this? We asked the EPA Removals Program to come up and help us last summer, and they did an extensive survey of the, the general area around Elmwood Avenue doing soil gas sampling and indoor air sampling for us. We've narrowed down the um, impacted area fairly well so that we have a very good idea of the impacted homes so that we can address those. We've done a lot of indoor air sampling on our own um, with consultants that we've hired, which is part of the money that we've spent along with the work the EPA did. Um, the degree and extent that we're trying to understand, um, since most of the contamination appears to be around the sewer line, it's really hard for us to get samples next to the sewer line without causing an impact to the sewer line. So some of the work that we're trying to do is to come up with what the best remedial um, option will be. So whether or not excavation and disposal or there's some other remedy that can happen, we don't know how, how deep it is. Um, luckily groundwater is pretty deep in this specific part of Burlington. So we're trying to understand how much mass is there to understand the degree and extent so that we can figure out the best path forward for remedy with that specific source area. Are, are, are you feeling confident that you that the individuals, the homes that are impacted, you, you've covered that? Or are there likely to be more homes that are affected? I think we've done a really good job identifying the impacted homes and working with them um, to try and address how to take care of their homes. Um, we have done a, a really good job um, with outreach to the residents. I think we sent close to 40 um, letters to everyone we knocked on doors just to make sure that we could sample either their homes or their soil gas so that we could get some good data to figure out who was impacted and who wasn't impacted. And do you have a sense of what the potential cost at the end is to the state? I'm just thinking about the capacity of the fund to cover this. Yeah, so the, we're estimating it's going to be um, around $150,000 to address some of the indoor air impacts and then do the additional um, degree and extent of characterization. The cleanup costs are going to vary based on what we find when we get closer to the sewer line and that could be upwards of $300,000. That would be initially borne by the state and then recouped from whatever parties are found responsible? Correct. So we will do tax recovery through court actions. So that could drain the fund. I, that will come close to draining the fund. If the, I'm remembering what the no, fund has about million. Million. Oh, million. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Fortunately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and to Senator Sears's concerns, I, I I would just say that I hope that we approach or spread as large as we can the ability to recoup the costs of, of doing this. I don't know if it's the city of Burlington, but whatever parties that, that are out there, that we should be looking at them to pay for the cost of the damage they caused. It's always our intent to yeah. try and recover yeah. those costs. To me, it's not just the city of Burlington. You know, as large as we can net of a, we can cast, that would be good. Thank you. Okay. I need a motion. So moved. Senator Kitchell has moved that we approve. I need a no second. second. Senator Westman has seconded. Further discussion. If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Okay. Thank you. All right. Maybe it's been very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Sarah and Candace, if you want to, it might be the only way to hear. I'll tell everybody the acoustics in this room are terrible. <laughs> Maybe they're good up there. But, um, we need everybody to talk up. If anyone in the back is really struggling, yeah, why don't we do that? Let us know. But the acoustics are bad. We have your three hands up. 
Okay. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for the opportunity. It's uh, been 14 years since uh, I had this position, but a lot of things haven't changed as I'm starting to realize uh, as we move on. I'd like to, if it's at all possible, because I want to wait for Secretary Quinn uh, to be here as well, to sort of move the IE and E uh, portion of this until the end and start writing with the strategic plan update, if that's okay, Madam Chair. Yep, that's fine. Um, so let's, let's start with this. Last week, this has been, uh, I've been on the job for one full week, so last week I had the opportunity to review the progress of the agency's strategic plan. I would describe the progress to date as a culmination of uh, a plan in developing a strategic plan and the progress to date as you can see some of the things that we have done so far um, on the slide deck is the fact that we have developed an agency-wide project team and development plan we've onboarded a consultant to support data analysis we've compiled evidence and trend analysis from state national and international uh, sources and submitted legislative reports we've conducted cross-agency focus groups we've facilitated dialogues with department management teams two rounds of that and organized an integrated district and department feedback we identified and prioritized several challenging trends and themes which i'll just go in in a minute I did ask the team last week, after I had the opportunity to review this, um, to do a couple of things, and I hope um, I want to get your feedback. I asked them to focus on the five years instead of the ten years, and the reason I asked them that is oftentimes ten-year plans become less focused, and five-year plans are more focused than ten-year plans. I also said, ask them to look at how this plan uh, fits into the larger uh, state strategic plan because a strategic plan that doesn't fit into another uh, larger strategic plan really doesn't have a chance of, uh, of moving forward and I said look at this as an ongoing process um, that needs to be refined and implemented if we look at this as just a report it's going to be just a report. Um, so if we are really serious about a uh, strategic plan, then it's an evolving document that continues over time as we move forward. So the update is um, we've done uh, some work to date. We have more to do as we uh, move forward. Uh, quite a bit to do as we move forward. Some of the things that we've noticed so far and one of the things that won't surprise any of you in this room is the fact that the aging population in Vermont is going to have a major impact on us. Um, and how we sort of move to address those impacts is something that is going to be um, within the strategic plan as we, as we move forward. So that's an update of where we are on the strategic plan. Uh, again, more to come. But a lot has been done, but a lot more needs to be done as we, as we move forward. The next item, um, Sarah, I'm gonna need you up here. I think it's fiscal pressures as we, as we move forward. The way that I've, um, uh, it, we're on the, this slide deck, um, Agency of Human Services, Fiscal Pressures. I've divided sort of the workload here um, because I have to get up to speed on the federal uh, CHIP program uh, as opposed to when, it, when I was knowing it before and also some of the uh, caseload um, items that I've asked Sarah, I'll ask Sarah to address. Uh, the first one, uh, is an update on the Brattleboro Retreat. I am fairly familiar with this. I've been briefed quite a bit on the uh, Brattleboro Retreat, the status of the 12 level one beds at the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, construction is on time and scheduled to be completed in the spring. These are level one, 12 level one beds, uh, completed in the spring of 2020, that's May. 
Um, we do have the operating funds once those beds come online in our FY20 budget, and it's about $1.1 million gross, and annualized, um, the cost of an additional $4.4 million gross will be included in the FY21 budget. So the total annualized operating cost of those, um, of those additional beds will be about $5.5 million. Um, an update on the capital funds. Estimated cost of construction has increased about 1.7 million. A couple of reasons for that. The original 5.5 million was an estimate that they have. Um, you know, these are old buildings and some of the uh, costs have escalated. We have mentioned to the retreat that we will support an additional uh, 250,000 dollars in capital appropriations to the 5.5 million dollars that would be reappropriated from existing human services projects and approved by the legislature um, this has to be approved by the legislature but that all cost overrun above and beyond the 5.5 million plus the 250 that we said we would support will be their cost so approximately 1.450 will be uh, will have to be assumed by the uh, Brattleboro retreat say that about one the 4.4 to 5.5 you mean they're going to have to eat yeah. the 1.4 yeah so they're only going to get four I shouldn't say only they'll get 4.4 okay. no it, it's they'll get the they've got the 5.5 okay um we are not going to we are only going to support 250,000 of the 1.7 over. So they eat 1.4. Okay. Okay. I think, yeah, I think. I'll probably ask that again. That, that's fine. No, <laughs> that, it's, it, it's fine. But we also mentioned that this needs legislative approval. So what, while we're on this one, um, where are you reappropriating it from, the 2.5? Oh, we. In the 250,000. 250, yeah. yeah. I think that's to to be determined where it is, but it looks like we're not going to be spending all the money in the Middlesex aspect of the capital bill and maybe looking at 250,000, shifting 250,000 from there. So we won't be spending Middlesex, but that would be, yeah, I'm assuming that we'll have that need in the future? Probably in the future. Yeah, okay. And for the... You said that you've got the operational um, cost of, in FY20 covered in the D, I in the DNH budget. In, in the base budget. In, yeah, and so where is that coming from? The, their budget was always tight, um, and so something's not going to be done as a result, or the last quarter. It's it's in the base budget. Yes, yeah, so there's roughly. Have we allocated that? Yes. 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 Oh, yes. oh well, I, I had forgotten. I probably I'm, didn't put anything. No, partial okay. year. It was a partial was it? year. Okay. Yeah. yeah you can, It'll have to be something. annualized. But yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm Thank sorry. Your pardon. I misunderstood. I, well, no, I, I actually misunderstood <laughs> what we've <laughs> done. Forgotten. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Um, yes. The kitchen. Um, <coughs> we had the beds at the retreat. And then in this year's budget, we added 12 more beds um, to go out more into the community. And they were described as more serving the CRT or providing um, a greater capacity for step down and therefore getting people out of emergency rooms. I'm just wondering if you could comment on those beds in terms of when they are coming online. You're looking for Commissioner Squirrel. She's there. Would you, would you comment on that, please? Sure. And so, it's kind of confusing because we have 12 beds and then we have 12 yeah. beds. Yeah. Yeah. So, for the record, Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. Um, so, in terms of levels of care, we have hospital level of care and then we have residential level of care. So, hospital level of care is the 12 new level one beds. Um, residential level of care is actually once someone is in an inpatient bed, we just step down residential placement for them. Um, the funding that you provided is for the most clinically acute CRT clients so that we can move them into a step down residential program in the community. And those plans are well underway. Are any beds actually online yet? 
Yes, um, so some of those beds uh, went towards um, expansion of uh, MyPad as well as expanding community-based programs um, at existing facilities. So out of the 12, what is that? Are we almost there? I, I think we're almost there. Um, one of the, the challenges, um, particularly with um, the MyPad model, if folks remember, this is a program in the Howard Center for it pairs independent housing um, with treatment supports on site. Um, one of the designated agencies that we're working with on this um, has been working to actually secure the physical building um, in order to provide the programming. Um, so that is one of um, the barriers that we're experiencing right now, but trying to work that through with our community partner, because this is all done in, in you know, with partnership with our designated community and public agencies. So they're coming on faster than the retreat event which will be later in the right. it, that's, that's absolutely right. And, and just for the committee's um, um, background, uh, I've asked Sarah to um, start looking strategically of where are we going with the whole system in the future. Um, and uh, we'll be developing that together as we, we've, we move forward. can move on to slide four in this package, which is about the Federal Children's Health Insurance Match phase down, otherwise known as CHIP dip. I don't know if Stephanie Barrett coined that or if it's actually something they call it at the federal level, but it's taken on a life of its own. So um, for the record, I'm Sarah Clark. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the Agency of Human Services. As you may be aware, CHIP funding has a special provision called the Qualifying State Option, which has allowed Vermont to draw down an enhanced FMAP for children between 133 and 237% of the federal poverty level. So we were essentially able to leverage roughly a 90% federal share. The current amount that's built into our state fiscal year 20 base budget is roughly $15 million. When Congress reauthorized CHIP, funding in federal fiscal year 18, they also included a phase down to this enhanced FMAP. We in Vermont are gonna start experiencing this phase down of enhanced match in the state fiscal year 21 budget. We'll be phasing down from <coughs> roughly the 90% to 70.95%. This is gonna have an impact on our general fund of roughly $4.8 million. That's for state fiscal year 21. We will see the second year of the phase down of this enhanced match in state fiscal year 22 to the tune of roughly $5 million of pressure on the general fund. After state fiscal year 22, we will be phased down on this enhanced match rate for CHIP um, to a kind of a relatively stable um, match for CHIP kids of 67.7%. That's the CHIP dip. Nobody told me this before I took the job. <laughs> I'm not sure it's a dip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Chip clef. Chip clef. Chip clef. <laughs> no other questions from the appropriations people. All right. Great. So for the other fiscal pressures, um, we are trying to highlight for you some of the things that are standing out to us at this point in time. I think. Um, uh, ideally, you will be familiar with the, um, several of these items. I believe I was in here in July testifying on the AHS kind of overall closeout picture. And so the first two bullets uh, under FY19 closeout items, I think, should not be a surprise to you in that similar to how we closed out state fiscal year 19, we are seeing pressures in budget adjustment and beyond um, within the Department of Children and Families in two primary areas, family services caseload, foster um, care specifically, as well as within the general assistance emergency housing program, um, we are seeing pressure in both the 20 budget adjustment and the 21 build. And so we anticipate accommodating for these um, funding challenges when we submit budget adjustment and the 21 budget build to you. Questions? Can I just call out? I want to comment on the emergency housing and 
working with some constituent groups in Bennington County, when you get told by an agency of human services employee that if this individual were in Burlington, we'd have a different outcome, it's really frustrating. I don't want to pick on Burlington today, but I guess I will. Um, but it's very frustrating. Um, these folks work very hard to try to get outcomes for many homeless people. This guy's, you know, will end up probably in jail because that's the only place that'll take him now. But in Bennington County, we're told by an agency of human services employee that if you were in Chittenden County, he'd get sued. Huh? I'm sorry. The rules are the rules, but how they're applied can be. Well, evidently, the housing available in one part of the city versus the housing available for someone who's an alcoholic who is living under bridges in the wintertime and suffering from extreme, you know, may have to have his leg amputated. It's a different outcome according to the people trying to work with this individual. Let me look into that. I sent something to someone. Okay. Yeah. No, it, it's a crisis. I had a mother with two children that fortunately had enough gas to get to White River to get find a motel so that they were not out living in their car mm -hmm. last winter. And she still may be out of temporary apartments because they can't get the vouchers to work. I have a question about so, um, the emergency housing. My understanding is when you closed out, um, spending in that particular area was high, yes. higher than um, anticipated or estimated in the budget. Um, what did that look like? How much uh, was that over estimate? Because there's been a, a lot of emphasis. We tried to get, particularly in wintertime, uh, we did get the Central Vermont Emergency Shelter up. The one in Rutland, to my knowledge, still was never materialized. Sure. So Absolutely. how did how uh, how did we end um, the year, and how much do we have? So probably yeah. we're going to have a repeat at the end of this year. Sure. So uh, emergency housing program ended state fiscal year 19 with a roughly 2.7 million dollar <coughs> shortfall um, that was backstopped at the agency. Um, part of that 2.7 million, let's say roughly 700,000 of it, was actually liabilities from the previous year that had rolled into 19. The reason I point that out to you is because it, that, that's one time in nature. And so we're kind of really looking at a structural challenge of around $2 million in the emergency housing program. Out of a total of, oh geez. Um, out of a total, I don't want to give you the wrong number, so let me uh, get back to you with that number. Is, okay, if we had $2 million, could we we'll get it shortly. find housing? I mean, is the housing there and the money the problem, or is the housing just not there or priced out of? Because we're talking a broad range. We're talking people with alcohol issues, yeah. mm -hmm. and I'm talking a family without alcohol and drug mm -hmm. issues, um, all not being able to find housing. <coughs> well, um, you may recollect in this budget, for the first time, I think since the mid-90s, we did an increase in the TANF assistance. Yep. Um, and, um, and the maximum benefit for a family of three, a mother and two children, was what, $640 uh, dollars a month. And that's for everything, housing, shelter, clothing, etc. cetera. So um, it, uh, you cannot find um, housing for the amount of money. And um, we did, for the first time ever, do us, relatively speaking, it was a, a decent increase, but um, it's still far short of uh, what our housing costs are today. So, and, th and those are families is just driven by well, lack of money, right. not other complications like um, substance abuse or domestic violence or whatever. Okay. There. If, if I may, the, the strategic planning process that we asked you to go through, I think this is a topical area that Jeez. we hoped would be part of that. I, I can't think of 
any agency program that I've worked with that hasn't said, oh, housing. And, and so I hope that that will, you'll, you'll give us some good thoughts on that, along with transportation. That seems to be a good thing. Yeah. Okay. You'll definitely be part of it now. <laughs> um, according to Stephanie, the total GA budget is around seven million. So you can see yeah. so that, that's substantial. a large percentage. It's a very large percentage. Is that the total for GA? Yeah. Um, so it's like the total grant line for GA in the budget yeah. document. Yeah. So there's other components in the so GA budget, budget, but yeah. Yeah. emergency housing is certainly the largest. Yeah, this, this is the total. Yeah. This is the title. I thought it was yeah. more like eleven, but yeah. Okay. Uh, two, uh, some of the other, uh, there were two things um, that I want, three things that I wanted to point out um, because one we'll be exploring later this afternoon with another committee, but 211 contract is not one of them. I wanted to put that on the table. We, last week I asked the agency to explore a more robust ex, uh, response. Uh, to the current situation with the 211 contract while trying to avoid spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it. Um, I will report back to JFC, uh, JFC in the very near future on uh, this explora exploration. Um, it's a matter of days, not weeks, uh, when I will report back to this. But um, like I said, I've asked the agency to give me some more robust alternatives in this area. So the short answer is you understand that it's I, a critical problem I, and you're working on it. I understand that. Okay. Um, um, when I saw that this was on my agenda for my second week, I said we better put 211 on here and talk about it. So, um, yeah. um, um, so what what does that mean? I mean, will will the contract continue? Are you looking for a way to to support it? I'm looking for a way to support it um, uh, at 24/7. What components are in and what components are out, I don't know yet. Um, and frankly, I didn't get to this till Thursday, so um, I'd like just a little bit more time to figure out what's the best avenue that, at the same time, doesn't cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. Well, originally, two on one did not do the after hour emergency. Right. It was more the information and referral and a partnership with United Way. And I think somebody said we were spending about a half million dollars to support that yeah. information referral system. And then a few years ago, DCF expanded to use it in this way. So um, is there money um, already in the base that is available if we're not purchasing it from Indiana or whatever state it was, um, is there money that is available to support this alternative yet to be um, developed? Yeah. It, we are looking at those questions right now. I don't know if there's money in the base at the current time uh, for this. Or does 211 need all, everything that's there in order to... Uh, yeah, that's, those, that these... Was, wasn't that a private contract? Mm -hmm. In-state private contract. <laughs> There are two contracts that are getting confused here. There's the contract that we have with uh, 211. Uh, 211 had a contract with Indiana, and, and that that was the snowball effect that sort of happened. That canceled, um, and and now we're in the situation we're in. But um, we need we need to take this seriously as we. Uh, well, we had snow in Danville yesterday in the air, so yeah, we had it about you, yeah. you know, <laughs> cold weather is not far away. You that. and the banana belt probably passed. Yeah, we had <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> it's perfect. No, no, perfect. Je perfect. Just, just so you know, it's late this morning because my bridge notch was closed. Yeah, there was <laughs> seven cars I heard stuck in there yesterday. Oh my God. Mm. I'm going to try to go back to two on one oh for a second. Um, so you're going to be giving us within a week or so, is that what within we're days. saying? Yeah. Within days, and that'll come to the committee? It will okay. come to the committee. I just want to be clear of what we're yeah. looking for. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sarah, with DSRs? 
So delivery system reform investments, we just wanted to bring this uh, issue to your attention. I think some of you are probably aware of it because of recent events, um, but we are, as we develop uh, our budget adjustment for fiscal year 20, we are taking into consideration these requests uh, from the ACO. Um, as I said, it is still under development, so we don't have any final numbers yet, but it is part of um, consideration. Um, if, Madam Chair, can I move yeah. um, Friday I went to bed really worried uh, about LIHEAP and the LIHEAP block grant. We had not received the funding. There was no clear indication from the federal government of when we were going to receive the funding for LIHEAP. This morning I woke up and found out that the money came in uh, <laughs> over uh, the weekend um, at 90% of last year's amount. We'll be getting that money out. Uh, I, I, I plan to had spend more time on this, on sort of contingency plans and everything that we had uh, developed. But we plan to uh, get the money out on uh, November 12th, uh, which was the original date that we had planned to get the money out. Uh, we'll be finalizing all the IT um, uh, the, the things that we have to do on November 7th. But the funding uh, has come in. Um, at 90% of the last year's level. And, and so that's, we're getting 90%. We're not going to get another 10 later on. Yeah, I'm okay. not, I'm not certain on that, but, um, but I was worried we were getting zero. Right. No, uh, I, yeah. 90 is better than zero. <laughs> yeah, I, was just, yeah. yeah I, I don't know what, what will happen. There still isn't a, 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 a continuing resolution yeah. on any of this. Yeah. Um, so how the federal government is giving us the money, I, as long as we got it, I'm not asking. going to cash the check and spend it. Really that, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what is 90, or what, what's the difference? I, I think it's around $10 million. I haven't really. Uh, so the 90% the, the award is roughly 18 and a half million. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So I think to, you know, it would be in the you know, 20 million range to get 100% of the award. Okay, 100% of where we were. Right. Okay. Nothing 100% about this program. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Global commitment. Global commitment. This is an area that I'm generally well versed in, as you realize, as you probably all know, that um, I was intimately involved in the original 1115 uh, global commitment waiver. But I've noticed things have changed uh, since then, uh, to some extent not for the better, with constraints in the amounts and how we um, sort of use the Medicaid money so that we can spend. I'm, I am becoming familiar with the uh, new variation of the 1115 wa waiver, but I thought, so I wouldn't stick uh, my foot into my mouth. Um, is to uh, turn this section over to Sarah to give a clearer and more concise update so I don't say 10 million as opposed to 19 million uh, as, as we move forward, Sarah. Okay, um, so go to page two of the 1115 or the Global Commitment Waiver presentation. Um, for your awareness, the state has submitted an amendment request to CMS for a serious mental illness, SMI, uh, waiver to our 1115 um, waiver, which is our Medicaid program. Uh, we submitted that on September 9th. This waiver would allow us to draw down federal participation for services in psychiatric institutes for mental disease, IMDs, where the statewide average length of stay is less than or equal to 30 days and the maximum is less than 60 days. So, from a fiscal perspective, this will essentially allow us to shift about $12 million in expenditure from investments to um, our regular program Medicaid. Uh, this is critical, and we'll talk about it on the last slide. This is critical as we assess our uh, ability to make delivery system reform investments um, underneath our investment cap. We uh, anticipate that this waiver amendment will be effective for January 1st of 2020, and we are in the beginning negotiation stages with CMS. I, I want to make clear, um, though this is shifting 12 million from investment to program, it's not actually new federal dollars. 
Um, I want to make clear that for the forensic patients, um, they will long term, um, we have to phase down those folks as part of our IMD phase down, but we still have the authority to leverage federal dollars for the forensic patients as part of our investment authority under our existing waiver now. So the 12 million is net of the forensic? It is, the 12 million total will be shifting. Um, and but then, I thought you said some would still remain in investments for the forensic. Correct. So it's net then. Correct. Okay. Okay, the next slide, just in general, um, as we talked a bit about uh, during the session, we are in our preparation phase for a renewal of our next 1115 waiver. Our current waiver expires on December 31st of 2021, which is really not that far away. Um, we are currently in the planning phases and we'll be requesting legislative authority from you in the FY21 Big Bill to pursue this waiver renewal. Um, we anticipate that negotiations with, with CMS will begin in January of 2021, and the new waiver would be in effect on January 1st of 2022. So some of the big considerations going to slide four for our next waiver renewal, uh, we talked quite a bit about this during the last session, is our budget neutrality cap which is essentially what we have to spend overall in our Medicaid program. Longstanding CMS policy requires that 1115 waivers have to be budget neutral to the federal government. So that means anything that um, we spend with our waiver has to be less than what we have, would have spent without a waiver. So in Vermont, what our waiver has allowed us to spend Medicaid funds are our investments, that's one of the key areas in the calendar year that we're in now, uh, that's $138.5 million that we would not be able to spend if we did not have our current 1115 waiver. One of the things that the federal government has signaled to Vermont and to all states is that they're going to continue rebasing budget neutrality, which essentially means they're going to continue to tighten down on that overall Medicaid cap, how much we are allowed to spend. And so as we prepare for negotiations, this is one of the key areas that we are focusing on. In addition, um, November, next November is an election year, and so with the change in federal administration can come um, you know, new areas of focus. I think it is important to remember that when we negotiated our last waiver, which is where we really started to see the kind of tightening down of flexibilities that Vermont has enjoyed for years, that was under the Obama administration. And so the Trump administration is really kind of still continuing on what um, had been a tightening that started with the prior administration. Can you tell me what WOW is without waiver? Yes, WOW is without waiver, uh, WW is with waiver. Wow. Wow, that's right. Um, slide five, just um, it gives you um, it's thermometers kind of at a glimpse. Um, prior to the last waiver negotiation, our overall Medicaid spending cap was cumulative over five years um, and at such a large amount that we would never have the state funds to even come close to getting close to that cap of spending. But as you can see from um, these thermometers, uh, with the new definitions of budget neutrality, we've gotten closer than we um, ever would have uh, previously. So the middle thermometer is for calendar year 19. We are uh, predicting to be within 8% of our cap, roughly $114 million. For calendar year 20, we are um, slowing a, showing a slight increase um, to 11% of our overall cap, um, just to kind of give you a flavor of what, where we are now and where we think we're going to be. The last slide talks about our investments. So underneath our overall Medicaid budget neutrality cap, we have a sub-cap for investments. The small, the small table with the numbers shows you over the calendar years um, what our annual investment limit was. So the middle column of $138.5 million, that's for the calendar year that we're in right now. So even though uh, we are still um, you know, a quarter from this year ending roughly, 
we are predicting to be roughly on budget when you see a balance of $304,000. You'll see that prior to calendar years, we were basically on, um, on budget in both of those years. As we look to the future, you do notice that there is more room in the futures, but that's because we are assuming in uh, most cases level fund budgets. And so we know that over time, um, spending will change and that we will likely continue to push up under this investment cap. Um, so the analysis that my team has put together does allow for the rentable rate increases that we um, both did last year, um, as well as for the 12 new beds coming online. That's a significant pressure um, on our investment cap. In addition, in this scenario, we are assuming that we are making some delivery system reform investments, and so we have to make sure we have the cap authority underneath our investment cap. We also assumed that, that um, the um, SMI, Serious Mental Illness Waiver, that we talked about on my first slide, that we get that authority in January. We need that authority so that we can make the delivery system reform investments as we move forward. And so I think the bottom line, space underneath our investment cap is tight. So let's, uh, Secretary Quinn. Okay, yep, we're going to put the agenda on. This is a uh, joint presentation between the Agency of Human Services and the Agency of Digital Services. Uh, we've submitted the required report on the integrated eligibility and enrollment project as a prerequisite for releasing the third, third installment of the monies, $750,000 appropriated through the FY 2021 capital bill. Um, the update gave the status of various projects as of October 22nd and reported that three out of the four projects that were anticipated to be delivered in 2019 were either done or on schedule. The fourth product, uh, the business intelligence, has encountered delays and is now scheduled um, for delivery at the earliest of February, at the latest of April as opposed to the original date in July. In 2020, three additional projects are scheduled uh, in addition to the CMS uh, mitigation commitments for the aged, blind, and disabled so far. The premium processing and the online application deliveries are on track. The master data management project uh, has been put on hold because of a number of the number of projects that are in flight. Uh, these presentations uh, have been made to other committees and uh, we would request the third installment of the 715000 to be released. Uh, John, I don't know how these usually work, so take it away from whatever you want. I don't want. think there's any set project. <laughs> I would just say, John Quinn, for the record, Agency of Digital Services. Last time we were here, um, Deputy uh, Diva Commissioner Cass Madison was sitting where Secretary Smith is sitting. Um, and to just talk about that transition for a quick moment, um, the AHS leadership has put uh, new people in charge um, of, of the project. And we're doing a retrospective right now on the roadmap that we've uh, taken and the work that we've done to look at the overall uh, project technical roadmap and how it aligns with MMIS to make sure that we're utilizing our money and our resources as effectively as possible across not only human services but across the enterprise. The new leadership in place uh, comes from the MMIS side of the DIVA, um, the DIVA house, so to speak, and uh, we have a very good working relationship with them. I feel very confident 
in uh, the communication going on with them. And uh, under Mike's leadership now, I feel very confident that uh, going forward, we'll, we'll see project success with this. Questions? Is there, um, we took testimony on this at our Joint Information Technology Oversight. Um, and is there a memo from uh, the uh, chair and co-chair of that committee? If I might, this is Catherine Benham from the Joint Fiscal Office. There's not an official memo at this time, but there, there were six legislators who were supposed to provide a recommendation. And they emailed the, the, the chair and vice chair of JITOC, emailed and said, yes, they approved this, but they're going to keep, they're concerned about some of the projects and they're going to keep an eye on this project and we'll continue through the rest uh, until the legislative session starts uh, talking and hearing more about this. Um, so of the six chairs that had to provide a recommendation, I heard from five, and they all supported providing, approving this funding, but um, along with Dan Smith's recommendation, keeping an eye on how it's moving forward. And I think there were some other questions, but I'll let you all. Um, the other question was, um, you're able to keep in budget because some things are um, delayed um, in terms of when they're coming on or the expenditures. And so there was concern of overall, it, are we going to be within the estimated costs? And we were assured, and I think this is the purpose of this financial sheet on the back, that yes, there's variability when bills come in and so forth, and some things may be coming in higher, some a bit lower. We weren't seeing as many of the lower ones, but the estimate was that it's still within that um, uh, estimate that was provided to institutions when they were developing the capital bill request. Mm -hmm. So that was, am I the only one on joint information technology here? Okay. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm just letting you know what our discussion was. And then the other was the, um, the consolidation, recognizing that the uh, Medicaid management information, that's what the MMIS is, it's a claims. It pays the bills, it pays providers. So the MMIS, which has been headed up by Lori Collins, it was viewed that because um, sort of the functional um, uh, inter interplay between uh, these two IT systems that um, it would be good to consolidate the project director. I, I, what do you call it? I love all this new jargon, in flight. Does in flight mean you're started and your plane has left the airport, <laughs> but it hasn't yes. landed yet? Yes. I mean, I, you right. know. From the time it leaves the gate, right? Whether you're taxiing on the runway or you're in the air. So, so um, we could have just we're, been we're sitting uh, in line at the end of well, the runway. No, so. I, I take it as in moving, right? Okay. So the project, um, the contracts it's, have been executed, there's people on the ground, and we're starting to plan. So, um, that was what we had for testimony at the time that has led to this. There was concern about, obviously, when you have a change in leadership, but um, Lori has been with Diva. She has been there so long, it, she would start in social welfare. So it's like 40 years experience in working with this. Um, and so the money was the other, and the concern also was around what has what's in the red box, and that was, um, uh, you know, the, um, the delay um, of that. So that's sort of the discussion from your, what are we, Jai Talk? Yes. Oh, all right. Is that? Jai Talk, yep, yeah, that that's correct. A, a pretty much capture. Yeah. Our, our and, and I believe uh, Cassandra uh, Madison uh, walked through the ups and downs with Senator Brock after the last meeting to show where the, where the low points were and where the high points were to, to you know, further explain in more detail than the report had. I'm glad somebody knows what's going on because I'm feeling totally lost at this point. Mary. Um, thank you. <laughs> what does doing a retrospective mean? We're looking back at what we've done so far on, the, on all of the projects that we've undertaken. Um, as part of the IE portfolio, what's worked, what hasn't. We've been moving so fast for the past couple of years on making sure we're hitting timelines and building um, new capabilities for Vermonters that we thought with the leadership change, getting everyone up to speed, looking back and doing lessons learned. What, what have we learned so far across these projects? What have we learned about our timelines? What have we learned about 
uh, budgeting for, for these type of development projects? Um, what have we learned about our resourcing? You know, in, in the beginning, I remember we were trying to do all of this in-house or, or a large part of it. And we're, we've been unable to find the right skill sets to come to work for the state of Vermont. There's a workforce sh shortage um, that we experience just like everyone else. And that's been challenging for us to be able to get some of this work done. So to look back and say, you know, that hasn't been working for us. What's our strategy going forward to make sure that we can meet the timelines that we need to meet? I, I should say to the committee, I, I had a number of questions that came from Representative Fagan and, and Representative Cole, so I'm trying to kind of, plus throwing in my own questions as, as we go along. Um, one of the concerns that I think Dan Smith raised and, and Representative Fagan did was the issue of leadership and having one individual responsible for this. And I, did I understand that we now have somebody appointed who, who can be held accountable? It's the individual Senator. Lord yeah, so that is the person in charge. Right, so, so the way I would address this, because I think this is really important, no, it's always Mike's heads yes. on the line. Yes. That's, that's why I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, um, let me look yeah. into this a little bit more. But, but yeah. I mean, one of the things we've heard clearly from our consultant is that there should be one person responsible for managing this. And, uh, and obviously, the secretary is at the, or both secretaries are at the end of the day on the line for this, but we want one person accountable in, okay. So there, is, so there is a program person responsible, and that is that at this time is Lori Collins, who's doing a great job. At the end of the day, the governor is responsible, right? And yeah. holding uh, Secretary Smith and I accountable to make sure that this does, uh, this gets done. But with these types of projects, there's program pieces, and then there's technology pieces. So for you know, uh, what, the way I look at it, you know, this has to be a 50-50 partnership under this new model of ADS and the consolidated model of IT resources. You can't hold Mike completely accountable for something that may be technology related that is solely, you know, on the agency of digital services and vice versa, right? So in my eyes, this has to be a shared accountability between Mike and I. I understand what you're saying about one person, but in this model, um, the way these big technology projects work, um, there has to be shared accountability. I am 100% at the table sharing that responsibility to make sure that we get this done. You can be a little nervous. I understand what you're saying. I understand okay. our government model, but again, we need one person who can call and make the phone call whose only attention is on this, not on the vast array of obligations you all have. Right. Under you. Yeah. Where does that little triangle go next? So, so I'll, I'll speak if you don't mind. Go right ahead. Um, in my eyes, in our uh, organizational structure that uh, we've recently redone, um, it's Lori Collins it's, it's at the top of that. So if we want to say how come this doesn't happen in the way it's supposed to happen, Lori is the person we want to have up here explaining to us what went wrong, what went right, Okay. Same, I repeat the same way Cass Madison has right. been the lead yeah, I, of uh, individual for. I, I haven't had an opportunity to really delve into that model yet, um, but you know I understand what you're saying and the way that I understand that Cass Madison had sort of um, you know you could call her. Mm -hmm. I I want to try to replicate that. As, as much as possible. I had one meeting on this already. Um, I just need to sort of filter through this. And then, as I'm sure we all were, uh, a deep concern about the business intelligence project and getting it going. Um, so we've discussed that, but I just feel obligated on behalf of my two colleagues who aren't here to say that there's a real concern about that, as well as with the master data management project. I, I know that's on your radar. Um, I personally wonder if at what point do we have the courage to say it's not working, we're done trying to do it this way. And I, I would hope that we 
that, that you all look at that instead of, it, it just seems that with a lot of IT projects, we just keep trying to make it work. And um, we find ourselves four, five, six years later continuing to try rather than succeeding. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we're all deeply concerned about, about that and knowing when to fish or cut bait. Um, to that point, Representative Fagan's original thought, his re original reaction was, we should not be continuing with this funding. We need to be, you know, holding, um, it, understanding this better. Subsequently, having spoken with everybody and understanding the consequences of not going forward, um, he's cautiously supportive of doing that, which again, I mean, that's where I am and Representative Toll were in our conversations about that. But we just wanted to be clear about the degree of concern that we have um, with this. And that, it, again, at some point we need to say this isn't working if it's not working. And we're looking, obviously, to our legislative committees, but also to you all for assuring us that we've got it. Representative Hooper, let me just assure you, um, and I have a reputation. I'm not afraid to pull the plug if things aren't 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 uh, aren't working. Um, I'm, as you know, I'm pretty results driven, and so if the results aren't there, then why pour more money into it? Thank you. Okay. I think the other thing that we need to and it comes back and it's referenced all the time. And that um, was the system that we set up at the time um, with the ACA. And, um, uh, and that's in essence being replaced, which is so um, <coughs> as painful as this might be, and this one area of delay, um, if we were to decide not to move forward with all the green, which is some indication of success, then we would be with what we have, um, which is enormously expensive um, and um, uh, still requiring, last I knew, 50 employee workarounds. So um, I think um, we are cautious if this had more red, I think we would certainly be more concerned. But in making any decision, I think we've got to also um, weigh out what does it mean to stay where we are or to pull the plug. And if you should recommend that, then we would have to understand what are all those implications. I, I would assume if the plug were pulled, that there would be a plan for you know how we're how we're managing this. Right. You know, I'm not so saying just stop, yeah. but when do you know to go on a different path? Mm -hmm. And now I wish I wouldn't have said pull the plug. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's not quite that simple. It's not. <laughs> you take a different form. Yeah. So I think it's important to mention that we we triggered a contingency. So we have two paths going in parallel right now. Mm -hmm. The path that we were on to do things in our environment that we already pay for in the state. And then the second path is to add the uh, Oracle Business Intelligence Enterprise environment to the uh, Optum FISMA environment. There's all these acronyms. I'm trying to make sure I spell them all out here. Um, in parallel, we need one of those things in order to meet our federal requirements and compliance. So we're, we're looking at making sure that we have multiple paths so if we fail over here, or if it's not working, we're able to offer that other option, as, as I think is what you're saying. Thank you. I mean, the importance of technology came home to us. As many of you know, we're going through justice reinvestment, too. And Mike was, I can't remember if you were commissioner, it was secretary of administration, or I can't uh, remember. services I can't. at the time we did justice reinvestment yeah. one. But, one of the challenges we're having in trying to move forward is the lack of data that they're able to get from both DCF as well as the Department of Corrections, Department of Public Safety, and all the different agencies. So if you try to make data-driven decisions and none of the systems talk to each other, it creates problems. And I asked, so I asked the Commissioner of DCF, well, what's the recidivism rate among juveniles who end up in the adult system. Well, we, 
we, if we even tried to find out, we couldn't do it under our present system. So I think it's, before you decide to pull the plug, <laughs> it's tremendously important to have that information. I've got to be more careful with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that we've always seen that as part of the value in doing this in our environment that we're already paying for, is being able to use that data across not only human services, but across the enterprise where appropriate. And, by having systems siloed all over the place, it becomes very hard to create those data driven systems. So I think it's an example of why. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? So you need a motion to authorize the uh, release of, what's it, 750? Is that? Yes, it does. Yes, I do. Yep. I'll make the motion. I'll second that. Okay, so the Kitchell made the motion to release the next set of funding. Senator Westman seconded further discussion. If not, further discussion. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. That motion has carried. Okay, that gets us. So we have a uh, Dan, we're going to let you go now. Secretary's out. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank Secretary you. of Transportation in the hall. Oh, great. Okay. Some of us make it longer than a 20-minute lunch before our next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. It's great Welcome to be back. back. Yes. So you're going to do two strategic plans at the same time? Well, what's the second one? VSAC. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's going to look like a piece of cake. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. We'll see you. Good to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> she's out. She's out. Oh, she's out of style. She's dressed like a person. We were left alone. So. Okay, we're ahead. We're now back. Oh. Okay. Back to being serious. Okay. Secretary Flynn, welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, we're here at your request as a follow up, I believe, to the first meeting. Some questions were posed regarding the condition of the bridges that we were just advising some of you of at that point. We followed up uh, with the committee, and I think perhaps there are some more questions for us. So we're prepared to discuss what we've been able to release the public records request at this point. We obviously this is still an ongoing investigation being worked with the attorney general's office. So. We will talk about what we have released and we'll try to answer whatever questions that you have, bearing in mind that we have to maneuver the investigation carefully. Okay, and I think also how do we prevent this Correct. from happening in the future? Correct. And with me, I think you all know uh, Deputy Chief, or excuse me, Chief Engineer, sorry about that, Chief Engineer Wayne Simmons. Uh, Wayne spent the bulk of his career also running our structures division, which is bridges. So. Uh, he's eminently qualified, and we will discuss um, how we provide oversight to our field staff, which we tried to outline in this letter dated on October 3rd, but it's easier to do it in person. So I think I would turn that piece over to Wayne because construction and managed materials is under the highway division, and we can start there. Okay. I just ask one question, um, and that was, that was in the minutes as well, um, and that is, is there kind of any um, any action underway in terms of compensation? Because at least from what we read in the paper, right. the life uh, span of these structures is less than would have been right. the case. And so, um, at the same time, um, AOT is looking at these oversight uh, practices. Is the <coughs> attorney general or any legal action being taken in terms of compensation? to the state for um, the, the reduced uh, utilization? Uh, currently, no action has been taken. The Attorney General's Office has filed a notice of false claims and potential breach of contract, but no actions beyond that have occurred. We are tracking all of our expenses related to this project, um, you know, our engineering time, the testing, the materials testing, the contractor that's doing the testing, and what, what Wayne can talk about is what we see as the mitigating fix, if you will, which will deal with the shortened lifespan. So those are all costs that we will we'll attempt, certainly, to recover th 
through the process, but that process hasn't ensued yet. But the plan is to absolutely, absolutely. I, I did have a conversation with uh, Assistant Attorney General Diamond. Uh, he offered to come before the committee, but said he'd have to do it in executive session. Um, but uh, they are pursuing uh, what to do about the loss. <coughs> I, I would. I guess I characterize it as the lost years off the project. I guess it was supposed to be a hundred year and uh, down to 25. So, and so I yeah. know that. I mean, I don't even know how long, but since the bridges are, one of the bridges I use almost daily, um, I wonder. I think it'll be good for as long as you're I suppose I'll probably take my license away before the bridge comes, but um, I'm just concerned that, you know, do we wait until it crumbles or do we replace it sooner than we expect it? How do you deal with this? So, so if I may, I can, I can start there if, if you would like. Um, so for the record, my name is Wayne Simmons. I'm the chief engineer for the highway division for the agency of transportation. So, the, the, the design life of a bridge is not an exact science. We are um, designing bridges every day and putting in certain practices that we believe that will get us to a hundred year life on a bridge. Um, as you may know, we're replacing bridges that are um, uh, nearly a hundred years old now. Um, but what we forget is, is that for the first 50 years of their life, they weren't subjected to road salt. So the first 50 years were, were relatively easy on those bridges, which is why our interstate system, we're replacing bridges that are 50 years old because they pretty much have had salt attacking them for their entire life. So what do we do to extend the life of bridges? It is in the types of materials that we choose. Um, we design them with reserve capacity. So they're not designed right to exactly what we need. So um, and they also um, are designed in a way that reduces the ability for salt to attack them. So um, I believe that it's my quotes in the newspapers that have talked about we may have lost up to 20 years, 25 years of life on these bridges. And what may not have been quoted very accurately in the paper was is that I qualified that by saying that I do not have an equation that says here is how much life but based on my experience and what I know of the situation, we may have lost up to 25 years of life on some of these bridges. And where I get that from is the fact that, as I talked about it, Mother Nature and salt um, attack our bridges. And if we have construction practices that eat into that reserve capacity that I talked about, we won't have that reserve capacity at the end of the life of a bridge to have that stay open and be safe. So um, it is somewhat of a, of, a, of a guesstimate. And if I may, I have some things to hand out and I'll get back to um, what, we're, what we're looking at in terms of repairs um, that we're considering. So I'll, I'll just pass this out so I can set the stage for, for what we're talking about. So, um, Last June 2018, um, we were asked to meet with the Federal Highway Administration, our local partners here, and they made us aware for the first time of allegations of improper construction practices on four bridges that were constructed by Jay McDonald. And at the time, you can, you can see in the handout that the first sheet of the handout is a redacted version of what we were shared that first day. Um, it talked about uh, two bridges um, on or over Route 279 in Bennington and two bridges on I-91 in Guilford. And um, the, the allegations had to do with anchor bolts and reinforcement in bridges. So just to kind of set the stage, because, and I apologize, um, I am a little bit of a, of a bridge geek, so sometimes I will say things like I know what people are talking about, but I just want to get some language out. So if, if we go to 
this picture of Guilford Bridge 3 on I-91. Looks like this. So the, what you see here is a picture of, of one of the bridges in the allegations. There's the superstructure part on top that carries the traffic. And then there are these intermediate supports. Those are called, I'm gonna call those bridge piers, okay? On this bridge, there's two piers. And then at the ends of the bridge, there are these components that I will call abutments, okay? That's where the bridge ends and goes into the roadway portion. So when, when we got the allegations, it was vague in terms of what, how much might have been cut, where it was cut, whether it was in the abutments or the piers. Um, so, so we immediately took a look at the designs and we started to consider the risk associated with those allegations. We reviewed all of our bridge inspection reports, what we had on the project to see if we had any idea if we could narrow down what exactly um, was meant by potentially cutting anchor bolts or um, cutting reinforcing steel. And what I will say is that from a risk standpoint and the way that the bridges are designed, we were much more concerned about any of those actions happening on the piers as opposed to the abutments. There's a bunch of structural reasons for that, but um, the short story is, is that if reinforcement was cut in the abutments, it likely was not going to be a safety concern because right now we weren't talking about life. We were talking about, all right, immediate safety concerns. What do we know and, and how does this affect the safety of the traveling public? So, so we did some work, um, some initial work, and um, in September of 2018, we went out with a substantial um, effort hiring a specialized consultant to do what we'll just consider or I'll describe as non-destructive testing on the bridge piers. That non-destructive testing is using radar and other high-tech methods to look inside of the concrete um, to look for instances where it was likely that reinforcement and anchor bolts had conflicts which could tell us whether or not there could be issues there and to try to figure out what the extent of that risk is. Um, so we got some preliminary results and um, in January um, when the final report came in we were certain that there was a number of conflicts that made us concerned that these allegations there was something to to really um, look at. We immediately um, initiated some um, engineering expertise from a consultant to look at the, the way the piers were designed and to make some conservative assumptions on how many reinforcing pieces might be cut in any of these bridges and to tell us if the worst case came through, do we have a safety concern? Again, not knowing how much or the extent, we just knew that there was likely an issue. Um, the results of that analysis told us that um, to varying degrees we had used the reserve capacity with these assumptions in all of the four bridges, um, but that even with those worst case scenarios that today there was no safety concern immediate because the bridges were still relatively new and, and it was safe. But we still um, wanted to make sure that we knew the extent of it. And um, in, I'm sorry. Was the survey done just on these four bridges that you're, you're indicating or was it, because I'm trying to, is this confined only to 2011 bridges that they were completed? So that non-destructive testing was confined to the four bridges in the allegation. Um, in the spring of this year, as soon as the weather permitted, we did order um, our bridge inspection teams out in the field and they inspected a special inspection hands-on to look at all of the bridges that J.A. McDonald had constructed between 2002 and the present. You have a list of those bridges that we inspected in your package. Um, 
not all of them had peers, but the ones that did have peers, um, I um, ordered the bridge inspectors to actually have um, full access so they could get up there and see them firsthand to see if there was any reason to believe that any of the bridges weren't performing the way that they were supposed to. Yes? Um, company got sold sometime between uh, the period of time you're referencing. Mm -hmm. So, yes. are the allegations both under the prior ownership or isolated with the um, subsequent to the sale? Oh, you don't know yet. So, the the allegations and the uh, and the construction of these bridges preceded the sale of the company, and they were all in a um, a set period of time. They were all, at least for these allegations, narrowly um, confined, but um, you may be aware that um, previous to these allegations, um, Jay McDonald also was subject to an investigation, again from a whistleblower, about um, improper construction in a Bristol bridge in which the Federal Highway Administration um, and the federal government settled a, um, a monetary and they had to go in and do repairs on the bridge after it was constructed to um, restore that. So once we, once we had the engineering review of these bridges done, um, I prioritized the next steps based on how much of the reserve capacity was used. Because again, to me, I care about the long term, but immediately it was about safety and making sure that we knew what was going on. And because of the, the design and the types of the bridge bridges, the East Road Bridge over 279 was our highest priority to um, get to the end of the investigation and to take a deeper look. So. Um, in July of this year, using the results that we had from the non-destructive testing, um, we started a destructive investigation, not something that we take very lightly. Um, it's never good to break into new concrete to see what's under the surface, but it was necessary here to confirm um, what we were, what we believed to be the case. So in uh, in July, we be began testing destructively on the East Road Bridge, and um, we have um, received um, confirmation based on that testing that um, some of the allegations were true. Um, the, the good news is, is that we did not discover anything outside of our initial assumptions that um, we made in, in terms of the safe um, aspect of the bridge. So um, based on that, we are moving ahead and we have um, actually started a project to repair and restore the reserve capacity that we originally had in this bridge. And that construction will happen um, most likely in the spring of 2021. And this is the bridge that takes you to the Mount Anthony Middle School. Yes. So it becomes the school buses going over this bridge daily, you know, dozens of mm -hmm. kids from all over the supervisory union go to the middle school. So it's, uh, I go under the bridge, not over. <laughs> so all trolls go under the bridge. So right. And, and again, you know, I, I mean. But I've been under it. When I yeah, I'm just saying all trolls go under it. Near, nearly every bridge has has school buses that go over it. Um, my family no, uses, uses bridges. It's right next to and, the middle school, so you're right. using this. And, and, and I guess, you know, if at any time I thought that this bridge wasn't safe for all of the loads, including school buses, we would have done something. Um, I would have had the bridge inspectors down there that day with parking their truck across that to stop it. Um, or the, one of the things we could have done would be to make it one way to again reduce the loads. But um, 
from, from a certainty standpoint, after the destructive testing, um, as an engineer, I know pretty certain what, what I'm analyzing there. So, you know, I think that we are in good shape until 2021. We'll do some repairs to restore that reserve capacity so that we'll get to the, the useful life of the bridge as it was intended. So um, that was what I was prepared to sort of tell the story of where we've been and where we are with those bridges. I'm happy to take questions on that. Go for it, right? So, yes. If, how do I know that on the way up here, I used a temporary bridge in Pittsburgh, and I think I emailed you about that. The bridge is temporary, but it was built in two lanes so that traffic could go both ways and you wouldn't hold up Route 100. But something happened, and so somebody didn't build it wide enough or decided it wasn't wide enough, so you put in a traffic light to stop traffic both ways, which is probably for safety. But who's responsible for that particular decision to put up the traffic light? Actually, when I went across it this morning, there was a fuel truck and, and a dump truck coming the other way. I don't know how the dump truck, we had the green light, but the dump truck was there. And both passed flying. So how does that, I mean, you obviously paid to have a two-lane temporary bridge. And then while you're building the new bridge, how do we know, how would you know if that new bridge is being built to the specifications that you're paying for? And who's responsible for deciding the temporary bridge wasn't wide enough? Those are the, and two questions. Who gets charged? Right. Who gets who gets the bill for not doing it right? Okay. So um, those the, are two the, questions. All right. So so let so me take the the responsible. Yeah, and I hate piece. to use that bridge, but it just does. Yes. So so in in terms of who's responsible for the decisions about bridge safety, <laughs> whether it's that bridge or or any bridge, okay. Um, we, we have a, a four teams of bridge inspectors that are out there daily inspecting bridges. Um, and we also get information from the field if it's a construction that gets pushed up through that group. They are doing that analysis and um, essentially the bridge maintenance engineer, okay, that's in charge of the bridge inspection group is the first one that says we either have a problem or this is good. If there is a problem, ultimately that gets brought to me and I'm the one that makes the decision about whether or not something should be posted or restricted um, in the, in the um, guise of safety. So it's not a contractor that gets to make that decision. It's, it's not um, field staff out in the district that get to make that decision. Ultimately, that decision um, comes up through um, very qualified people and they make a recommendation to but myself. Who pays for the, the failure? I mean, it, it's it. Our bridge, anyway. So, I know, but who does the contractor who didn't put it in properly or is it a engineer who didn't plan it properly, or so, how does this happen? I, I'm did, I'm, I so, you so, so, so on that particular project, um, the, the, the one-way versus the two-way um, is not really a capacity issue. It's more of a geometric issue and a safety issue during the construction phase. So, um, <laughs> so we, we often design and specify because in that case, we designed the, um, okay, so. the, we designed where the temporary bridge would go, we designed the curves, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes we can't always predict exactly how traffic is going to go through there, and we can't always get that right. And so sometimes we do need to make an audible where we say, you know what, this two-way two bridge isn't working. So Quite clearly in this case, what was done was you, um, the bridge was designed a certain way and they didn't complete the design in a certain way. 
During the construction process, we have periodic reviews and inspections by um, our people of the work that's being done. So someplace in that inspection process, some, um, something wasn't done for them to put the materials that were designed in the place. What I don't see in any of this, um, this outlay is what are we doing to make sure that that inspection process as these um, projects are going forward. I think the agency in all of this had the right design, they had the, um, um, mm -hmm. the right pieces. The company didn't do what they said they were going to do when they let the bid. Right. So how are we making sure that the, in that inspection process during the building that we're changing that to make sure that we don't have this happen? Before Wayne gets into the details, Senator, I would say this. We cannot fully address that in an open forum, which is what I believe the Deputy Attorney General is referring to. Okay. okay? Um, Wayne can, with detail, talk about the job of our resident engineers who are on our projects, if not daily, nearly daily. At times, we also have consultant inspectors. We have a combination. It requires communication from a contractor to the state and from the state to the contractor. Yeah. So I think that's the limit on specificity regarding these bridges that I really am comfortable giving at this point. We can talk about our ongoing process. I, and I think the point I, I, I like to make I, I though is we're, we're not changing something. Right. We, we believe the system we have is a, is a decent system, but it requires partnerships. And so I just wanted to make that I, I don't want to compromise any of our case. But what for me is most important is that going forward, not looking back or anything, that our inspection process during the construction mm -hmm. period is up to snuff so mm -hmm. we catch these things before it happens to us again. You know, it kind of seems like bridges built in 2011 and I'm in 19 and this is just coming out. It's the luck of the draw that we caught this now. And I want to make sure that what that the companies that get the contracts build to our designs. Right, we do. <coughs> and I know you do. But I mean, that what that would require, though, is some review of the process of inspection during the time of construction. And um, I don't have to have an answer today, and I don't want to compromise any case because I think that if all of this is true. Um, um, in my view, McDonald's should pay. Um, but I want to make sure going forward that we get what we ask for. So mm -hmm. we would agree with that. So, so let, me talk about, let, let me talk about a little mm -hmm. bit about what we've done since, since this has come to light. Um, we do have a, a rigorous safety program. Um, the safety program, frankly, starts in design. Because again, you know, the design does recognize that not always are things built perfectly. There's some tolerance, so we have to accommodate that as part of the design. But what this has um, highlighted yet again is, is that um, there are certain um, means and methods that a contractor might choose to install anchor bolts on a bridge that are more risky than others. So we have um, put out guidance to all of our designers and to those that write our specifications that um, we will no longer allow any um, anchor bolts to be installed after the concrete has been placed. Essentially, the, the operation that caused some of this conflict. Um, that's taking a little bit of uh, the um, creativity out of the contractor's hands, but I think that it makes sense because it does lessen the risk that this is going to happen again. We've also um, put out specialized training this spring to all of our field staff, including the consultants, about what the importance of inspection of this particular type of work is, how to make sure that we get what we're paying for and that it's installed correctly. Um, but 
but at the end of the day, um, we do have a, a safety program and, and uh, actually pass this out you can have some of these. This was a, a memo that um, we put together for Secretary Flynn to um, Commissioner Gresham um, as, as a result of the last meeting knowing that there were some questions. Um, on all of our projects, we do have a resident engineer and we have field staff assigned to each of them to inspect the construction activities that go on. This, there's, there's a lot that goes into what our quality assurance plan is and how we carry that out, but the takeaway I'd like to leave with all of you is, is that that is risk-based. We do not have the staff or the budget to watch every single thing 100% of the time um, because it's just not possible. But we are looking to make sure that these activities that are higher risk do have that inspection and they do have the oversight in the field. And that said, when the contractor is um, scheduled to be on the project and scheduled to do work, we schedule the field inspection to be there to match that. Um, and I think that um, as more comes out about this, you'll see how this dovetails with um, preventing what happened um, on, or is alleged to have happened on these bridges. I guess I can't recognize myself, but I'm finding it concerning. If this were just one bridge, I'd say we made a mistake, but this is a whole lot of bridges that were done. And fortunately, it sounds like there's no immediate safety concern. And I understand that we're working it through and we're doing some more training. But obviously, somewhere in our safety inspection program or something, <clears throat> there's a problem. And I understand that there's lawsuits and there's, and I'm sure it's who said what to whom when gets in there. Um, but as we go forward, I hope before, when this is finished, that we hear mm -hmm. what happened in a lot more specific, yeah, mm -hmm. a lot more detail. Mm -hmm. And if you have, you know, if you need more personnel, if you need better equipment, I've heard a rumor you don't always have the most up-to-date mm -hmm. tech equipment, oh, um, that we get to hear that. I mean. I'm sitting and looking at all these nice new shiny bridges, but uh, you guys drive to Moortown lately? Um, and then there was East Montpelier. Uh, that bridge, I didn't drive over it for a few years. Um, I got to go under some of the bridges in Montpelier and see where they were before we closed three of them. I just, we need to make sure that something of this scale mm -hmm. doesn't happen again. We would certainly agree with you. And I wish that we could sit here and tell you things that I think would speak to your concerns, but it, that it's some of those things that, in deference to the investigation that the Attorney General's office is running, we're really not at liberty to speak about at this point. I think it's important, I hope you believe me, um, I think I can talk about this because it's a matter of public record. If you go back to the Bristol Bridge project and the settlement between J.A. E. McDonald and the United States government, there was nothing in that process that suggested the Agency of Transportation was at fault for not finding something or not seeing something done. What occurred there was the contractor was charged with putting anchor bolts in the bridge, which were deliberately shortened because of the conflicts that Wayne talked about. It, it, 
it clearly wasn't done while a V-Trans inspector was there. But once it's in the concrete, you can't see it. Well, bolts are, yes, yeah. that's true. But the bolts were shortened. So the point I'm trying to make carefully, and again, that's a matter of public record, and, and I'm comfortable talking about it. The point I'm trying to make is, I'm, a moment ago I talked about there needs to be communication back and forth. There has to be a partnership with the agency. As Wayne said, it doesn't matter how many employees you have or how many pieces of equipment you have. This summer we have about 58 active construction projects simultaneously around the state of Vermont, so I'm obviously coming to conclusion now with the weather. It is impossible, it isn't possible, to have eyes on every single muscle movement every day on every project. But as Wayne said, when these critical portions of these projects occur, we always are. But this all assumes the partnership. This all assumes that everyone on that project is working in the same direction. And again, it's, it's hard for us to not be able to share things with you, and I can only imagine how frustrating it is to want information to either determine whether you think we need to increase our oversight or, or just to understand the situation. And um, I certainly empathize with that. So I think that only question, or not the only question, but the question I've got is, um, and maybe it's a timing question, uh, given the fact that there was this issue around the Bristol Bridge, mm -hmm. shouldn't that have tightened our concern, um, and I know that right. putting aside these four bridges, which were done in 2011, right. but we have contracts currently with this company right. in Waterbury and another, Just Waterbury, I don't know which one. Um, so, so do, let me, thank you. Bristol, in, in the chronological order of construction, Bristol was the last one constructed. So it's not as though Bristol had occurred we found out the government came in, there was a settlement, and then the bridges we're talking about down in Bennington and Guilford were constructed. Those were constructed before Bristol. So my point is, whatever had occurred on those bridges in southern Vermont had already occurred by the time the Bristol project. I assume that that was right, but we, but we entered into two other contracts. We did, but we then did. I'm just, we, I'm just we did. We entered into uh, at least two. I mean, the cabinet two, group two. Yeah. So the 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 settlement oh, on Bristol yeah. <laughs> and the investigation done by the Federal Highway Administration and the federal government um, settled on the fact that this was an isolated incident um, perpetrated by the report says two rogue employees that decided to do this on behalf of of their employer and when. When we reviewed the evidence and the settlement, we didn't have any other information to believe that that wasn't true. Correct. So that resulted in um, financial penalty for Jay McDonald and, and substantial cost for them to um, fix the Bristol Bridge to get the capacity back to where it was supposed to be. But it also resulted in two Jay McDonald employees being disbarred for life on working for on federal projects. So taking that at, at face value, um, we were progressing and Jay McDonald was in good standing in terms of being pre-qualified to do other work. Now that doesn't mean that we weren't still looking at their work closely. Um, they did construct two bridges following Bristol on the Cabot Danville project most recently very small bridges that did not involve piers so, and were, were subcontracted. So again, um, and we've looked at that pretty closely. So, so your, your point is taken, I think it's, it w our approach was, okay, here's the settlement, but we were in a mode where we were verifying that they, would we, they were doing the work. And the Waterbury project that's currently under construction does not involve bridges and is a very sort of different, um, utility and drainage type project instead of a bridge project. And in Waterbury's case, when we signed that contract, we did not have evidence. We had allegations, but we did not have evidence. 
I had seen paperwork when I became secretary going back 25 years on Main Street Waterbury, and I had to sign off on the last piece of that and made the decision that the right thing to do for the taxpayers, the right thing to do for the residents of Waterbury was to go forward with that because, as Wayne says, it's a completely different type of project. It's a road project. The company had a history of, of success and capability on those types of projects. And we are working very closely. We are watching that project very closely. But for a whole series of reasons to have attempted to have broken that contract, the state itself probably would have been held liable. And it could have taken a year or two or more to re-engage at a higher price with a different contractor. Meanwhile, Waterbury continues to wait. That was the reason why that decision was made. I, 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 we're now over time, so I'm going to have to start moving this. My only comment along. is we have a JTOC committee, and mm -hmm. I didn't know whether there was any discussion about um, transportation oversight, of which some of us are members yeah. as well. Um, but, right. Yeah. Um, so I didn't know whether the, you probably had discussions well, with the chairs of the two of the policy committees. I would, I would think that the transportation committee should take it up. It, it, where my specific concern is not after the fact inspections on the bridges that we have out there, now, but when you identify high risk items and you need changes in both um, specification and employee training. I think at some point you owe it to the legislature to say, here's the changes we made to address those specific things. Because if, if the materials that they're using are not what were specified ahead of time and we're caught flat-footed after the fact, that I don't care which company it is, um, we should catch that before the big project gets finished. Yep. If, and you're right, we would, I would agree with that. It's not about substandard materials, though. Mm -hmm. And again, I, it's just hard to okay. not tell you what I'd like to tell you. Yeah. Okay. We will. I was at the Judiciary Committee will also follow up on the, because it's like we wrote the False, False Claims Act, we are responsible for that. I mean, an analogy. We'd like to follow up if it has to be an executive session. We can do that. You know, this might be a bad analogy, but to, to the point about we changed inspection practices as a result of this, or we gave different information to our field staff to look for different things. I think still the analogy I might offer is 50 years ago, if you look at how police departments policed, they policed. I think maybe based on a body of knowledge that they had regarding the activities that they oversaw in a society. As a whole myriad of activities changed in 50 years, we have a whole different way of how we police to meet those needs. So the analogy I'm trying to draw is uh, it isn't so much about policing was not sufficient back then or it's not sufficient today, but circumstances change. And, and well, I, I, I think in this case we understand it. We understand that um, the vehicles that travel are heavier, we understand that more salt is being used, we understand those have all changed. This is really a case of are we getting what we asked for in That's the specifics of the right. contracts That's that we exactly signed, right. and apparently you've changed some functions that you've done, and for a comfort level, I think the committees of jurisdiction, which would include juris um, um, judiciary and transportation, ought to be apprised of what you've changed. Talk to Senator okay. Manager. I'm going to have to wrap this up because we've got one, at least one more issue we need to cover. That's fine. Okay. Thank you for taking it up, Madam Chief. We all have bridges. <laughs> Some of us have a long history with bridges. Some drive in the And they don't, so. so. <laughs> when they I were the choice they had a great reputation. Yes, they did. They did. They did. I, you know, I after Bristol, we... I wrote letters to the delegation and I wrote letters to the Federal Highway Administration, which are on open record, um, you know, in support of the company. Because as Wayne said, everything at that point that we knew indicated that it was 
in the words of the settlement. Right. It's okay, I'm Sue Klein from Joint Fiscal Office, and we're going to start off by just going through quickly the, the grant approval process, which the committee needs back on. Or, uh, basically, just as background, we changed the grant uh, uh, approval process a little bit, and Becky will go over that. And so that in the law last year, and so what we need to do is make some changes to our policy. Sure. So Rebecca Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, so last year in the budget bill, there were some changes to clarify the, the grant approval process in, in Title 32. Um, a lot of that was separating out the executive grant approval process from the legislative and judicial branch process um, so that the, the legislative and judicial branches don't have to go through the same um, process where they're sending the grants to the governor's office for approval. Um, there were also some clarifications, such as adding some definitions to clarify you know exactly what a grant is, what, what state agencies that, that have to go through the process. Um, there was um, also some uh, reference to what a small grant means, um, if, whether or not a grant with a certain monetary amount has to go through the process. And then the last uh, sort of big change was that um, the Joint Fiscal Committee was um, given authority to implement uh, policies to, to implement the statute. Um, before this, the only policies that were in place uh, referenced the expedited approval process that was done off session. And so as a result of the statutory change, um, we drafted some uh, policies that speak to um, more parts of the process than just that expedited review. Just a, did you want me to go on? Well, no, I, uh, okay. think, I, I don't know whether you want to go through all of it or do you want to just um, highlight things from it or what would be uh, what would be useful? What do we need to do? Today? I, I, we actually have to approve it. Policy and the, the so maybe you better tell us what it is. Yeah, I'll be right. Sure. So, um, as so as I mentioned, the only thing that was in the policy before um, was what the process was for expedited review. Um, so this this is much more um, substantive, detailed than that. Um, so this is it. That's it. Those are the policies. So um, the first thing, first sort of big change it does is add in some definitions, and these are coming from what is in statute. So um, there's a definition for grant, um, for loan, and small grants, and state agency. And this is just trying to clarify what we're talking about in the policy. Um, the other uh, sort of change or, or thing that is highlighted in the policy is that um, in the statutory section it says that um, when you receive uh, materials from the governor's office it goes to uh, the joint fiscal office who then sends it to this committee um, but there's no timeline to that so what's added in um, section three is that the joint fiscal office staff will send copies of those materials once they are completed um, to this committee as soon as practicable. And I think that's trying to give Dan or whoever's working on it a little flexibility of if grant materials are received and the, the package isn't complete, then he can have a back and forth with them. Maybe, yes, when you, everybody know where this is? I, we just, I, yeah, I found it. Okay. Okay, so um, so there's just giving um, some little some flexibility to sending over the materials as soon as the uh, grant materials are completed. Um, although the the hope is to get them to you all as, as soon as possible. Um, the statute was also changed to say that the legislative and judicial branches um, had a separate approval process. So in section four of the grant policies. There's some language added about what it what actually has to be submitted. Um, so, they the Joint Fiscal Committee is um, requiring approval from the, the legislative and judicial branches 
of grants that are valued at um, more than 15,000 and those materials would be sent directly to the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, Section 5 under expedited grant review. So this was in the previous version of the grant policies. Um, the change here is that there, the process for expedited review requires that um, a majority of the committee um, vote to approve expedited review. There was a little bit of a conflict in the language before. At one point it said a majority of the committee, and then at another point it said seven members of the committee. So it was changed to six members to not um, require more than a, a majority. Um, I don't know the historical reason for that, but that was just more of a cleanup change. This is just to do the expedited review. Any one right. member can still. That wasn't going to be. Yeah, yeah anyone. Right. That, yeah. But is that clear that that hasn't changed, or I didn't find it yeah. that any one member can place something on the agenda? Yeah, and that 5.4 that shall not be waived in the event of an ejection by any member. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Okay. Just going to find it. Um, the. The statutory changes also try to clarify that you know if a, that the approval process is um, doesn't apply to grants that are under fifteen hundred dollars. So some nominal gift doesn't have to go through the whole committee process. Um, and but it does require grants over fifteen thousand dollars. So there's sort of an in-between amount between fifteen hundred and fifteen thousand. And it, it does say in statute that notification has to be made to the joint fiscal committee of those grants between those amounts of money. Um, and so the policy in section um, six, the small grant notification, is um, is asking that that notification is made on a quarterly basis. Okay. So a list of all the grants would be sent over that are valued in between 1500 and 15000 okay. And then um, the final change in statute that uh, had to deal with the approval of limited service positions. So the, the statute was changed to essentially say that uh, to give authority to the Joint Fiscal Committee to approve a limited service position in conjunction with a grant because the language was, that was what was being done, but the language was a little vague that that was, that the committee had that authority. Um, and this is actually a point that is in the other part of my memo. So the, the language was changed to say that um, if the position is explicitly stated for a specific purpose in the grant, um, that position is accepted pursuant to the same approval process that the grant goes through. So if there's a limited service position request um, for an executive branch grant, it has to go through that same approval process. Um, Can you just approve it a longer than that today? I think we have a five-year one. We have a five-year one today, right? Yeah, that's a subject I would love to revisit, but mm -hmm. not this moment. But okay. it's, it's right. just a, the, the, be, yeah. the, the way we use that term is getting yeah. broader yeah. and broader. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. correct. Some of these limited services can go on. I know we have any attorney general. It's a way of saying to the public that we have this many state employees. Right. But, right. It's a big issue. It is, it is. It's a yeah. much bigger issue than we yeah. can. Right, and there's, there's no statutory definition of limited service position, so we we put in the um, definition from the Department of Human Resources personnel policies. You know, that's, I guess, a guide, but it is a question of whether there should be a statutory definition. Yeah. Since they're not following their guidelines. Well, we're not following. Yeah. Or we're not, not either. Well, <laughs> they're giving it to us to right. approve. Yeah. We're approved. And then we're approved. <coughs> and then, um, I guess the, the second part of my the memo, the pro proposed revision to, to I have a question. Are you going to be communicating with GovOps or in other words we're saying we really need to deal with this language around limited service? Um, I'm just sort of like, well now we have it. Yeah. Um, how's it gonna we, we can we can yeah. give a we, uh, Are we gonna introduce it? Is mm, uh, 
But we're the ones who well, end up approving them. Let's yes. um, look so at the issue first and we'll get back to you on I, it. I think yeah. we just so want to, uh, we need to make sure it, it, it ends up on an action list so that um, yeah. we yeah. talk yeah. to we'll people and go off our side. You know, yeah. 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 At the very least, we should have, if, if it goes beyond these guidelines, it should be approved by the full committee. Something of that nature. Rather than coming. You know, mm -hmm. through the email system where six of us say yes. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. always raise a question about it, so yeah. <laughs> does it make any difference? Well, we don't have the authority to it. create permanent positions. <laughs> yeah. Good. We can yeah. Yeah, look at that issue. Well, this is the much larger issue of exactly. how we go through the process. Many people and, five five years Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yep. Okay. okay, so that is um, just a summary of what the policy is. I, I, do you have another issue that I raised in the memo that has to do with limited service positions? But I don't know if you want to deal Let's with Let's hold with just on the, on the policy, and then we'll just ask for stuff we can raise. It sounds like the, the rest of it needs more time, more time and like we're close enough now to be legislative. <coughs> Well, on the policy, I have a question about 2.2 on the loan. I don't know if you saw my yes, email I on did, that. Yes, I did. I did. Oh, I, I, I haven't seen it. Okay, okay, so this is good language. I just was wondering. Sure. So, yeah. so the, the definition of loan in the policy and in statute is referencing specifically loans that are considered um, a gift to the state where there's no, they're getting something um, for free, so something that is interest free or below market value. So would a loan that is at, that has an interest rate or is above market value or at market value, um, there's it's not relevant. It this. wouldn't it wouldn't need to go through the grant process because there wouldn't be there would be yeah you're, you're not getting anything a gift or anything for free. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what we need is a motion to approve. This document, someone, Representative Ansel, has moved. I need a second. Second. Okay. All right. Senator Westman has seconded approval of the Joint Fiscal Committee grant acceptance policies um, dated, I think we'll put in today's date. Um, further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. <coughs> aye. aye. Opposed say no. It carries unanimously. And just before we go on this, I just want to you want to five There's one issue that's going to come up in the statutory in yes. the session. Um, so this also has to do with limited service positions, not the duration question, but um, this came up, I believe, was this fall or first summer, um, late summer, where um, the judiciary had a request for a limited service position. And we realized uh, when looking at the language from last year that the um, it says that the limited service position approval would go through the same process as the grant, but the cross reference is just to the executive branch approval process. So the statute actually doesn't really contemplate um, an approval process that is separate for judicial and legislative limited service positions. So what that would mean in practice is that um, a judicial limited service position would have to go through a more cumbersome process than, than would be required for the actual underlying grant. So I, I came up with some proposed language just to separate out those processes. For well, I think we'll do it. Put this in a memo about yeah. limited service position issues and submit it to GovOps and mm -hmm. both Yeah. Okay. yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you both. Okay. I think, Steve, you have... Okay, I just wanted to flag for three issues, and then we'll um, break, hopefully not too late. Um, one is on, you know, one thing that's in my report is on the Ed Finance, um, the December 1 letter. It is going to be a little unusual this year because the arbitrator between, on the health care um, uh, determination is not going to rule until December 15th, and that could have a $25 million, give or take, impact on the Ed Fund, depending on which way they go. It's last best offer. So when the letter comes out, one of the things 
Yeah, it, yeah, it has to be one or the other. So we need to just think about and maybe work with the administration about how they present that letter because that's that's three cents in the tax rate, and it, it can be, and it's just a uh, or more. So we just need to, uh, as that letter comes out, make sure that that's handled in a way that's appropriate. Uh, second thing I just it was mentioned in the in the disclosure report, we did finish negotiation on a four-year uh, contract with Tom Kibet, who will be the an economist. Uh, it is a part of what, what makes us renegotiate rather than going to bid is um, the price of his contract, even though it seems a lot, 170000 a year, is probably about half or less than anything that could come close. And I talked to some other states in this area, and uh, it, uh, I mean, their numbers will be way even higher than that. And Tom actually did, well, he did sign a contract which has cost of living increases for the four years. He did mention that compared to other work he does, including for New Hampshire, uh, <laughs> we're less than half of any other billable rate. So, uh, <laughs> right, so, right. So I just want to, so it is done, and it is, uh, and at some point, four years from now, I mean, maybe, who knows what he'll, what his life, and one of the things we'll think about in the four years is, is this process of an external consultant make sense, but that's it. Final thing I want to flag that wasn't in the report, um, there, and actually um, uh, Representative Ansel and, and Senator Kitchell know way more about this, and they can talk to you if you like, or with you on this more. But there's the Joint Labor Management Committee is Legislative. Joint Legislative, Legislative Management Committee. Oh boy, okay, well, Legislative okay. Management Committee. Actually, okay. Catherine is involved with it too, staffing. I'm the least involved. But they are looking at the issues coming out of the NCSL report. And two of the things they're doing are, um, or have done, I think, is separating out the uh, IT component. And that means we'll probably move in the budget process a separate line item for um, <coughs> IT as opposed to having it under uh, Ledge Council. Uh, and so the second thing that they're doing is moving forward in some way with human resources capacity, which is a, a big issue in the sense of just maybe unifying, unify, unified classification systems, pay systems, things like that. And then the other issue which is just coming up increasingly is just sort of uh, uh, hidden bias questions and just how do we really recruit our staff and make sure we do it in a way that's better. And the details on that are not with me. And the only other thing I wanted to flag is there's been a lot of discussion about changing the structure. Um, the Joint Fiscal Office currently, I'm appointed, I was hired by you all and um, predecessors, my predecessors were hired by you all. And we do a lot of work with the committee, and one of the things that's come up is an issue of whether to let the Joint Labor Management, La Legislative Management Committee do all the hiring of all, you know, the staff heads. And I, I and it's just me taking the position, I think it probably should stay with the Joint the com Fiscal Committee, the hiring of the fiscal officer, um, partially because of the unique role that we actually do. Your committee does a lot of work in the summer that we have to make decisions and delegated things like, uh, the rescission process, and um, uh, I think you have in the in the past it seems to have worked very well. But you actually have an interest in who that person is and what it does. Um, right now, we have a dream team uh, joint legislative management committee, and we have two money chairs on it. And the speaker and Senate president both have been money chairs, so there's tremendous involvement. But that's not a guarantee. And. Uh, so it's just, that is an issue. I don't know if you all want to comment on it because you're much more tired. I asked Steve if he would at least uh, brief the committee because um, there's been uh, quite a lot of discussion about, you know, what would happen to the Legislative Council Committee, what would happen to the Joint oh, they have three Technology IT, they have three the IT Committee, committee. Um, and then what would happen to the Joint Fiscal Committee and the Joint Legislative Management Committee has not made a final decision. Um, I, I made the um, pitch, I guess, to the Joint Fiscal as it is, um, but I realized that we had not had any discussion in here, um, and certainly uh, this committee's uh, view of that matters. Um, and it, so to leave Joint Fiscal as it is, certainly in terms of its statutory functions, but also in terms of its staff uh, supervision and, and the hiring of the fiscal officer. So that came up last week, I think, last Monday in the meeting. Um, and it just seemed like the since other we're part here, we should be briefed on that it. That came out is um, 
Maybe some members of the committee really support. aren't that familiar with the functions and the responsibilities yeah, right. on the joint fiscal. And I thought um, uh, Tim was not there, but the speaker was there and, and yeah. really talked about the fiduciary yeah. obligations and that decisions have to be made when we're not in session. Right. And that uh, the nature and the creation of this committee is somewhat uh, distinct. I just think it, there's been conflict between the leadership of all the, the different players involved, and I don't think joint fiscal is um, is the center of where that conflict is mm -hmm. coming from. No, but there has there is a proposal um, to establish an executive director, which would sort of have I, um, be I, the I, I I understand which I think that, the committee is not likely to do, but it's possible. I, I understand that, but I'm just saying from my vantage point, yes. part of all of this has come because of the conflict in other places, and I don't think mm -hmm. that that conflict has been from joint, the leadership in joint fiscal. No. 